Hello, good evening. We have another night of Coca-Cola Cup action to reflect on this evening, but it's a competition now sadly overshadowed by the death of Chelsea Vice Chairman Matthew Harding. The 42-year-old invested millions of pounds in the club he supported since a child on the terraces at Stamford Bridge. Harding took that boyish enthusiasm into the director's box, where it even survived a sometimes bitter boardroom battle with Chairman Ken Bates. But Harding thrived most among the Chelsea fans. Few club directors could boast such a special relationship. A common bond reflected in today's tributes at the stadium, Harding's money is helping to rebuild. Well, joining me on the programme tonight, Robbie Earle, whose Wimbledon team played at Chelsea last Saturday. Now, Robbie, I understand Matthew Harding often dropped into your dressing room on those occasions. That's right. Um, it was the nature of the man that while he was happy in the boardroom, he was just as comfortable in the players' room, players' environment, and he, he was happy to be there, and, and he was very readily accepted. You couldn't say that there would be many directors comfortable or even, indeed, welcome in dressing rooms. No, he was very much accepted. He, he used to take part in the banter and the jokes that went on, and he always wished as well before we played Chelsea. Rude Hullet uh, today is quoted as saying that Really, he, he wanted to be one of us. He wanted to be mm. a player. That's, that's how he always felt, as though he wanted to be one of the lads and he was very much for the boys. And, and he, he was always very readily accepted and we always had a good laugh and joke with him before games. His enthusiasm, I know, was infectious. Uh, earlier right. in the season at Arsenal, I was sitting two along from him and, and Chelsea went two up and he was wearing his heart on his sleeve and then they went three two down and you could see mm -hmm. the despair and then they equalised. But that was the, the manner of the man. That's wasn't right it? and I, th I think it's, although it's a loss for Chelsea, it's a big loss for football on the whole because he was a guy who, who really loved the game. OK, thank you very much uh, for the moment, Robbie. Well, tributes to Matthew Harding have been made throughout the day. British football, unanimous in its expression of sympathy and affection. We're all still stunned here and trying to come to terms with what's happened. Less than 20 minutes ago, 20 hours ago, I'm sorry, we parted laughing and joking as usual. And with great irony, his last words to me were, as usual, have a safe journey home. He was really a Chelsea fan. This is something I would like to treasure. He had a, such an energy for life, uh, as well as for, for Chelsea. And um, that was infectious with everyone that he uh, came across. Matthew Harding, who tragically lost his life 24 hours ago, aged 42. Now nine Coca-Cola Cup ties to come this evening. First up, Charlton against Liverpool. Alan Kerbish's team unbeaten at the Valley this season, but that record about to face its stiffest test against the likes of Fowler, McManaman and Berger. A terrific cup time prospect, and there to enjoy it, our commentator, Clive Tillerson. Every ticket sold, record receipts inevitable, and the most successful club in English football for company. It's the biggest match the Valley has staged since Charlton Athletics returned nearly four years ago. And despite Charlton's lowly league position, they are unbeaten here this season. Number six, Richard Rufus, and number seven, Sean Newton, are both current England Under-21 internationals. Newton returns tonight, along with Anthony Barnes. Ricky Otto has extended his loan spell from Birmingham City, for whom he played in last season's semi-finals. Liverpool's team must be the most settled in the country. Eight of them are ever present this season. When you've won nine out of 12, there's not much call for change, except from those who can't get in. On the substitutes bench tonight, Stan Collymore, Neil Ruddock and Jamie Redknapp. Now, that's what you call strength in depth. Steve Dunn is the man in charge. Since their return to the Valley, Charlton have discovered the knack of ruffling the big bird's feathers in the cup competitions. Blackburn, Wimbledon and Sheffield Wednesday have all been dispatched in the last three seasons. Otto shot miscued, but still dangerous. It'll come for Anthony Barnes. Otto fouled Scales. But of course, this season, the top teams do not have the insurance policy of a second leg at this stage of the Coca-Cola Cup. Do with a bit of brass, really, couldn't they? They could do with a couple of trumpets or something. Look at the guy sound from there. Are you sure? Lieburn holding it up for Newton. 
little isolated on that right-hand side. Now Robinson. Got away from Barnes. A little space there too for David White. But the ball was just slightly behind him. John Robinson provided the cross. David White couldn't quite wrap his head around it. Thomas to Barnes, and now Bjornaby. McManaman. McAteer is four to scales is right. Barnes. It's opened up for him a little bit. Ricky Otto just managed to stretch out a foot. Dispossessed John Barnes. Just for a second, the Red Sea parted in front of Barnes and he was accelerating into the open space, thinking about a shot. Otto had other ideas. Lieber with a header on. White is there ahead of James. And Bob on the line can't keep it out. Charlton Athletic have taken the lead. It's David White. Two goals on his recall to the side against Bolton Wanderers, the first division leaders on Saturday. And now a goal against Liverpool. Inside of 17 minutes. Scales is headed back pass, didn't get there. James didn't get there, Bab couldn't get there, and White has opened the scoring for Charlton. About well, five years ago, it was rivaling Stan Collymore for a place on the Crystal Palace bench. He's had his ups and downs, David White. Here two years ago, goals in his first season, injuries in his second. He only won his place back in the starting lineup at the weekend. And he scored three goals since then. <laughs> Good ask Roy Evans yesterday whether he had any thoughts of maybe arresting a couple of players for this competition. None whatsoever. This is this game every bit as important as any other Liverpool have played this season. Barnes finding Berger, he's got away from Brown, it's Patrick Berger, it's come for Fowler and it's 1-1. Liverpool have equalised within four minutes. Robbie Fowler fed by Patrick Berger. John Barnes the orchestrator, that's a beautifully weighted pass. Berger made it his got away from Steve Brown and the deflection just carried it into the path of Fowler as much as anything and his finish typically assured one one and it's away from Berger Lieber Marlis has done well again so too though is Michael Thomas, and he's given it to Lieberg, and then he's given it to Skirts. Matteo, he was dicing a little bit there. White caught him in possession. Barnes, away by Matteo, only as far as Otto. Uh, he was a little casual on a couple of occasions then, Dominic Matteo. Even the flick away had uh, a less than authoritative ring about it. Otto, on his less favoured right foot, couldn't punish him. That didn't get the job done at all by Matteo. Fortunately, Otto's first couple of touches didn't really bring the ball under control. McAteer. McManaman. Barnes. Thomas. Bjornaby lifted towards Fowler. Well, there was a feel for handball then against uh, Anthony Barnes from the Liverpool fans behind that goal. And another against Lieber. This is 
quite. Good challenge by Matteo. Beyond the Liverpool back line, John Barnes has recovered well. And even on the edge of his own six yard box, Barnes, well, he's given it straight to Otto. He's got another chance. Barnes holds his hand up. He just wouldn't hoof it into the crowd. It's not in the nature of John Barnes to do that. He's probably wishing now he had it done. Tried to pass it away from that perilous position, and Ricky Otto got not one chance, but two on his left foot. At the other end, Anthony Barnes, the Charlton left-back, survived a penalty appeal. It certainly struck him on the arm, but ball to forearm rather than vice versa, in my opinion. clear, Robinson again, Barnes eventually, what a dangerous cross that was though, McAteer, uh, McMahon I should say, here's Burnaby, McMahon and Fowler, and now McAteer, and turn behind by Phil Chappell, devilish crosses played at both ends of the field, McAteer there for Liverpool, Rosso at the other end for Charlton. McAteer. Right by Brown. Now by Newton. Only white forward. Matteo back. Bab who did so well to deal with that Otto cross. Keeper, Fowler's there in support, and Fowler somehow, though he was at number four to one, got his head to the ball, but couldn't quite score. Well, full mark to Patrick Berger to begin with, because he certainly could have gone down when he had his shirt yanked. I don't think he would have got a penalty, he was just outside the box. But Robbie Fowler, even surrounded by defenders, got into the position to score and just couldn't quite get enough of his forehead on the ball. That's instincts when you're there first. Brown, Robinson, Lee Byrne, Newton, by Matteo. Down goes McAteer, and a challenge from Otto. done a fair amount of chasing back tonight, Ricky Otto. Newton, O'Connell. Full mark to Charlton Athletic, they must be kicking themselves that they couldn't retain their lead for a little bit longer. have not taken over since Fowler's equaliser, that's for sure. Every attack has carried menace. The Charlton have had their moments too. This is Barnes. Now Berger. And Barnes is there again. The enemy just checked. Barnes accepting the responsibility. rehearsing the uh, half-time team talk, which isn't very far away. Well, Charlton went in front for very long. David White with some expert finishing, 
following some rather shabby defending by Liverpool gave them the lead, but within five minutes, Robbie Fowler from a smooth Liverpool break had equalised. But Charlton Athletic are still very much in this cup tie at 1-1. between the goals by David White for Charlton and Robbie Fowler for Liverpool. Charlton's home record so far this season, four wins, two draws, no defeats. And they've shown that kind of form here in the closing weeks of last season. They might have been in the Premiership with Liverpool now. They only missed automatic promotion by five points, losing to Crystal Palace in the playoffs. It's been a tough act for them to follow this season. Well, Adam Kirbish and his team have gone about a tough job with uh, a good deal of determination tonight. McManaman through to Fowler. Chapel had a hack at it, got there eventually, but it's come for McAteer. Four in the box. Fowler left it and McManaman skied it. And that's actually come out of the ground. Sure, will be delighted that I've told you that. Clear the crossbar and the roof. Lieburn's touch. White. Now Lieburn. Well struck. But directed straight at David Jones. But he has caused Liverpool potential problems with his size and his aerial ability. And he was almost able to profit from them himself that time, Carl Lieburn. Barnes. Thomas. Thomas. Well, as well as anybody from Liverpool tonight, Michael Thomas. This is Jason McAteer. Oh, and Rufus Lee in the shower. It really wasn't a threat that he thought there was. There was a little bit of time and a couple of defenders over. Mike Hanneman. It's broken for Barnes and now McManaman. Beaten away by Salmon. Powerful snapshot from Steve McMahon. Patrick Berger. McMahon. Berger has just forced Bjorn to be a little wider than he wanted. But it's no sweat to Liverpool. They just keep possession and go about the job from base camp again rarely ruffled Bam knew that Lieburn was there headed on by Newton and now White and he's turned away from Thomas here and he'd almost broke for David White three kicks been given could have been worse for Liverpool was twisting and turning to some effect there on the edge of their penalty area. David James has set a wall of five. Charlton players are almost fighting over who's going to take this. Nearing the midpoint in the second half. It's Ricky Otto. Uh, his crossing has been a real feature of the game tonight. And he is capable of making the ball sit up and beg with that left foot of his. Just sat up a bit too much then. James had it covered. On the other end, McManaman with far more venom with his shooting, stretching Mike Salmon. And Kirbish, there was a man in demand recently, there was talk of Manchester City, particularly Queen's Park Rangers being interested in his services. Charlton certainly never wanted to lose him. Newton. Forced away by McAteer. Brown. Charlton 
Armstrong. We're approaching the last 15 minutes. Team four points off the bottom of the first division. Uh, still proving a match for the team four points off the top of the Premiership. There's many anxious faces on the Liverpool bench as there are on the home team. Otto will take the corner. Here comes Lieben! And let's say David James was perfectly placed. It's a thumping header, though, from Carl Lieben. James didn't have the move. Real summit meeting on the Charlton bench. Otto's first touch rather let him down. It wasn't a bad cross, but he wasn't his best of the night. Liverpool's last embarrassment in this uh, competition was five years ago when they lost at third division Peterborough. Berger. Well, he had a chance to avoid any embarrassment there, that's for sure. His skill carried him into a clear shooting position. Could have placed it either side. Easy said now. Leeburn to Otto. Oh, James has lost it. This is Lisby. Leeburn blocked by Scales. Newton! Oh, just wide. Athletic finish up with nothing more for the evening but a replay at Anfield. That is the moment that they will look back on. Three minutes left to play, and Sean Newton just unable to smuggle the ball past scales and in. It's a corner. James saved from real embarrassment. Tidied up by Fowler, cleared by McAteer. Here goes McManaman against Rufus. What a chance, and what an escape for David James, who was trying to prevent a corner, and all this gifted Charlton a goal. It's been an uncomfortable night for Liverpool, one way or another. It looked smooth and well oiled at times, but the job is far from over. But if they do progress, David James in particular will look back on that moment three minutes from time when his mishandle almost allowed Sean Newton the chance to win it for Charlton Athletic, who will go back to Anfield for a replay with one of the poorest away records in the Football League. But Alan Curtis's team have produced enough tonight to feel that they still have some kind of a chance of providing the upset they so nearly provided tonight. 1-1 one, one in the end. What was the game plan? What did you want them to do tonight? Well, we felt that uh, perhaps, you know, we had to set our store out to contain Liverpool. I, I know we're at home and we're in front of 15,500 people and a great atmosphere, but we had to set our store out to contain them first. And uh, we've done that. Um, we found it a little bit difficult after that to, to get into the attacking mode, but certainly you can't just come and throw everything at Liverpool because they will just soak it up and hit you on the break. What impressed you about Charlton? Well, they, they play football, that's, that's for sure, and uh, you know, they, they work really hard and made it difficult, closed us down in midfield, uh, made it difficult for us to, to get forward, and uh, they give a, a great account of themselves. We're going back there with just as good a chance as last year, there's no, there's no two ways about that, and 
I think the side would have grown in, in self-belief a little bit. We've been playing well, you know. We've let ourselves down, I think, twice this season. And the rest of them games, we, we've only won three, but we could have quite easily won six or seven. And if we'd have done that, we'd have been in a healthy position in the league. And I, I said before the game, I think that Liverpool would have done their homework. And if they'd have seen us over the last four games, we've been playing all right. It's never over, uh, that's for sure. And uh, these, these teams are capable of... Uh creating shocks in, in these competitions, as, as you have to see by results yesterday. I don't know what the results have been tonight, uh, but if you don't get it right, uh, they can beat you. Roy Evans, far from impressed with his side, but to Charlton, they'll be happy. What was your overall view of the game, Robbie? Yeah, I think before the game, Charlton would have settled for a draw. Um, they're having a sticky time in the first division at the moment, and to take on the might of Liverpool and get a draw is a credible re result for them. They got the start they needed, 18 yeah. minutes gone, and it was a well, it was well taken, wasn't it? Very well taken goal. Big call gets a flick on, and, and David White gets be behind the Liverpool defence. Does ever so well to get the ball up and over David James, who's one of the biggest keepers in the league. So, it's a fantastic goal for them. Six foot four and a half, David James. That is quite a feat, isn't he? Especially as he jumped in the air as well. That's right. It's a good skill by David White. He's gambled on um, big calls flick in it and he's got his reward. Now, Liverpool, they calmed their nerves pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. It was almost an instant reply. That's right. Um, it was a born through ball and I think Berg has gone in the inside left channel. Uh, rode a good tackle and, and Fowler does what most good strikers do. He got in the box, right position and managed to um, put the ball away. Little deflection here, maybe? Yeah, got a little bit of luck, but you would say with the ball and the run of Berger, they deserve that, and Liverpool was straight back into it. The fans expected, I guess, Liverpool to win at that stage. Mike Salmon, the goalkeeper, Charlton goalkeeper, made a couple of very That's good... That's right, made one or two good saves at important times for Charlton, and, and they managed to keep their heads up and keep battling away. And having said that, they battled away, mm -hmm. and then there came a moment. It was so agonising, this. It was agonising for the Charlton fans, but also for David James. I mean, what did he do here, do you think? That's right, he came tearing out of his goal and, and really let the ball go, and... To be honest, uh, Charlton will feel they should have scored. Um, a bit of a scramble, and, and Sean Newton really is, is really unfortunate. Hip scales, I think, on the back side. Look at this and now. Goes it's going in there. The side. I mean, it seems an eternity before oh. the ball reaches where it, its destination. I think Charlton got a chance. Um, no. I think they're going up to Liverpool, they've got to give it a go. They may as well throw everything at Liverpool and, and try and test them and, and see how well they can do. Yeah, there's nothing to lose. They may no. as well now go out. If they're going to go out, go out having a real go. That's right, you may as well get beat 3-0, then 1-0, and, and they'll have a right good go and, and see you know, how, how well they can do. And you never know. That's right. Arsene Wenger may have been in charge of Arsenal for less than a month, but he'll be well aware of the importance of the Coca-Cola Cup to the Gunners. Tonight was still something of a journey into the unknown for the Frenchman as his team travelled to the Potteries to face First Division Stoke. The commentators are Jimmy Greaves and first, Peter Brackley. A packed house, over 20,000 at the Victoria Ground tonight. Saturday's demise against Sheffield United forgotten as Stoke seek the kind of spirited displays that eventually accounted for Chelsea last season. Early defensive deficiencies cost Stoke their unbeaten home record of the weekend. Tonight, Lumakari makes two changes from Saturday's starting 11, bringing in Nigel Worthington and Kevin Keane for Mark Devlin and John Gale. Simon Sturridge and Ian Cranston are both still out injured. Up front, Mike Sheeran has gone four matches without scoring now, but remains a potent threat with his 10-goal tally from 14 starts. Arsenal's new coach, Arsene Wenger, has opted for 10 of the side, held to a goal as drawn home by Coventry but has called up Dutch international Dennis Bergkamp, only recently back from a hamstring injury, in place of John Hartson as Ian Wright's partner in attack. With the scoring goals, 10 already this season, or involved in controversy, Wright is seldom out of the headlines, and containing him will be a major Stoke priority. Taking the whistle is Keith Burge from Tonopandy in Wales. Stoke City kicking off, Arsenal second in the Premier, and unbeaten in the last eight league matches, Luke McCarry believes it's going to take something special from his team tonight to upset them. Indeed, he says it will need the best performance of my managerial reign. And Arsenal under Arsene Wenger certainly aren't taking this competition lightly. But a corner straight away to Stoke City. Drell has gone up, and Whittle as well. Keaton taking the kick. Brought forward by Kavanagh, then Platt for Arsenal. This is Worthington, who was dropped at the weekend, but now back in the starting lineup. Ian Wright defending for a moment. Tony Adams 
Some cool work there from the Arsenal captain. Steve Bowl, former Stoke player, of course. He began his career at the Victoria Ground. Indeed, he joined Stoke from school. Here's Bold now. Vieira, the Frenchman, who settled it so well for Arsenal. Here's Pickering. Well, Lubakari believes his team have the, the power to dominate sides, but he thinks they won't find that easy against one of Arsenal's strength. Towering header by Keogh, but straight to Worthington. Now for Scythe. Pickering making a good run through the centre. But he was being well guarded yeah, by that, Nigel Winterberg. That was very nearly a good ball by Forsyth. That. Because Pickering came inside Winterburn, and had he been able to get that ball, he would have uh, he would have been clear. This is a good ball by Forsyth. You can see the ball. Great run by Pickering because he got inside Winterburn. Had he collected that, danger for Arsenal. Here goes Wallace with Vieira. Kavanagh. Then Forsyth to Sheeran. Keep through the middle. Still Sheeran. A little change of pace then from him. Well, he couldn't find the end product. Surrounded by Arsenal defenders, but he's looking pretty sharp, Jim. Yes, he did well there, Mike Sheeran, but uh, I think he should have pushed the ball through to Forsyth. Sheeran's looking smart here, but Forsyth's made a great run, and I think it was worth him trying to get the ball to Forsyth rather than the corner field. Shearer. He took very neat with it, Mark Shearer. He needs some support. That was really on hand, but maybe the has found him anyway. But he's having to work hard at this front on his role, Mike Shearer. Well, he did well here, Mike Sheeran. Good control. Again, he had to take it on himself. Was fouled by Black. Cabra taking the free kick. A look for the likes of a Whittle and Drea. Yeah, lump it in there, son, and everybody go for it. In fact, it's Pickering who curls it over. And they got some big guys back there, Jim. Yeah, they have, but I don't see how you can do it any other way. Keats chip, Sheeran! Oh. Such a win to show that by Mike Sheeran. He nicked it so quickly. And he has scored his 11th goal of the season. And what a moment for him to get back on the score sheet after his barren run of late. So quick off the mark there. Well, he's deserved this goal. He's looked the best player on the field. He's nipped in behind them. Lovely goal. He got it between Tony Adams he did. and he David Seaman. He nipped in between the defenders. He was the man who was looking for it. Beautiful goal. They were found wanting that to the delight, I'm sure, of Lou Macari. It's all going to plan so far. But there's not much even a good defence can do against a really top-class, accurate ball and a super run. Lou Macari's teams are renowned for pressurising the opposition, and they've been doing that to Arsenal, no question. But here's Wittebert now on the counter-attack. In goes Vieira, and a chance for Merson. Ooh, good shot by Muggleton. Incisive attack then. Well, it's a lovely ball by Nigel Winderburn, and, and Merce tees it up beautifully, but I'm not so sure whether it didn't ricochet off a defender. It did, Nigel Worthington. Arsenal's corner. And this is where Stoke have to keep their concentration on these set pieces for which Arsenal are so dangerous. The arrow was in late, they're not Forsyth. Grant didn't like it. Keen. Here's Dixon. On a different wavelength, though, to Steve Pole. Worthington now. Sheeran. Worthington again. Right, uh, it was a good little one-two with Sheeran, but it, unfortunately it was on Nige's wrong foot. 
Well, it's a sign of an absorbing game, Peter. It's nearly half time and it doesn't seem like it, does it? In action all the way. This is Mercer now. Played it for Ian Wright. And Suberta denied him a shooting opportunity with his alertness at the back. Well, both Dreyer and Sigerson have uh, been outstanding this half. They've covered the ground, they've covered every anticipation that Arsenal have been involved in. Lovely stuff, good defending. Pickering. That losing out. Off Steve Bowl, is that a throw? Also, so the referee concurs with that view. Something very close to a corner. I think Stoke will be contended to keep it down here till half time now in this little corner. Kavanagh whipping over the cross, oh. and Sheeran is almost on the end of it. First half honours to Stoke City, they played really well in his first 45 minutes. Totally committed to the cause, and Mike Sheeran, who's worked so hard up front, has his reward for the one goal that divides the two teams, Arsenal. So Arsenal will get the second half underway. And with the knowledge that they're going to have to match Stoke City stride for stride in the second period. Prepare to overcome one of the hardest working teams in the first division. Here's Ian Wright. Is forcing his way through and eventually away by Nigel Worthington. Ian Wright, who didn't have too many sights of goal in the first half, and said Wenger, Arsenal's manager, down on the bench now for the second period. Worthington probably get rather hopefully forward, but he's found Mike Sheeran. Now, has he got any support here? For Scythe is outside him. Keen heading for the far post. A poor delivery on the final pass from Richard Forsyth. It was poor because they opened Arsenal up then and had a chance. Dixon putting it through for right. And Sigursa just recovered in the nick of time then. But he'd lost it for a moment. Forsyth to Sheeran. Now Kavanagh. Worthington. His experience has been vital tonight. This is Keane from Sheeran's flick. And he just didn't get hold of his shot. A very disappointing finish to a promising build-up. It was because, again, it was a lovely bit of football by Worthington. Beautiful ball played through. Sheeran read it superbly. Keane did. And really, that's a disappointing finish, isn't it? Dreyer's clearance to Kavanagh. Now Wallace, very deep for Stoke at the moment. Keen, taking on Vieira, the decoy run from Sheeran, and now here's Sheeran with a chance! And it was a super block from Martin Keown to deprive him of the goal. Yeah, good tackle by Keown. A lovely run by Sheeran again. Good combination, Keen and Sheeran, last few minutes. Lovely run by Keen, looks up, Sheeran's pulled wide beautifully. Good tackle. The wind is slightly in Stokes favour now, isn't it? So if they can belt the ball down, who knows what will happen? It's a good set. I think it was watched by Newcastle a few weeks back. Arthur Cox was viewing one of Stokes games. He certainly has the quality this evening. Here's Sheeran, the same thing we said of him. Played on to Kavanagh. Kavanagh strike for goal! Yeah, that was worth a poke. This wind is very strong in Stokes' favour. That was very good thinking by Kavanagh there. Winterburn to Bold. Fair cap. It was a delicate touch though. White didn't appreciate it. Off goes Keane. 
Sheeran's pulled away to the right, Cameron to the left here. And, and the, flag the was up. linesman has the last say there. But they're producing some very cohesive football now, Stoke. But King seems to be moving into the middle of the field and actually taking command of the situation when he gets the ball. Right, almost through ball three. Could be a chance here, Muggleton recovered his ground in time. As Winterburn went racing through. But yeah, Winterburn Winter. gets through and uh, it's close. Good save. Oh, Worthington to Keane. Dixon for Arsenal. Wright wanted it play through the centre, but there's no quality on the through ball. Bearcat now. Bearing down on goal, and the shot from Merson. Brilliantly held by Muggleton. A real snapshot then for Port Merson. Well, it wasn't really a good build-up. Bergkamp doesn't really get it to his player, but Merson nearly gets his foot there. Keown unchallenged. Honest, typically abrasive fashion. Whittle now policing Hartson. With cigarettes and following right. Nigel Winderburn to take the throw, and he's had a steady old game tonight, hasn't he? Nigel. You've done it now, you've caught him Winterburn, I did it early. <laughs> it's Worthington. Oh, it's such a difficult is, one. Yeah. Two Nigels, both wearing number yeah, three, right. Worthington and Winterburn. I've done it already. Well, they've both had a steady old game now. All right then. Hartson strapping with Whittle. And uh, his arm lunged out then, Hartson. And he's going to be in trouble, I think, if the referee had a good view of that. Whittle is sent crashing to the ground. I mean, you can see that this is where it starts. It's And he's got a yellow card, the first of the evening, if uh, my memory serves me right. That's correct. Worthington, Bentley get the free kick. Yeah. And a foul by Whittle on Hartson. Might be one or two interesting confrontations between the two in the last few minutes of the game, Jim. I think Jim. there might be. <laughs> Vieira, one of two Arsenal players caution now. Hartson to win it in the air, this is Pickering. And he got himself out of trouble very neatly. It was well played, wasn't it? But now Vieira. Winterburn. Nelson couldn't control it. So desperate defending by Forsyth, he maybe had rather more time than he realised that. Yeah, well, I think he might have left it to Whittle, actually. This is it, this is where they've really got to keep that 100% concentration we've been talking about. Old have got to the near post. So Muggleton's doing the right thing, keep it calm, slow it down, let everybody get in their places, no need to hurry. That's it. Here's Keown. Hartson scrapping again with Whittle. Now Paul Merson on for Wright. Wright's got through and the score. Magnificent finishing by Ian Wright. Well, by his high standards, he's had a pretty quiet game tonight. But, well, you just give him one moment, one moment of space, and he pounces in that spectacular fashion. Well, the move was inspirational because Hartson was at the front of it, and Wright, lovely turn there, just a little touch. Great goal by Ian Wright. This is what he's been waiting for, he's been playing for it all night. Just that one opportunity, and he's taken advantage of it. It's finished 1-1. Arsenal coming back strongly in the second half.
after Stoke had certainly dominated the first period. Whatever Arsene Wenger had to say at half-time, it did the trick. Arsenal were much improved in the second period. The substitution of John Hartson certainly was a factor too. And Ian Wright popping up with the equalising goal, his 11th of the season. But such a commendable, spirited display by Stoke, they will take heart from that. And for much of this game, they certainly matched Arsenal stride for stride. The final score at the Victoria Ground, it's Stoke 1, Arsenal 1. We know that they're, um, it's a big scalp for anybody to beat Arsenal, and we knew that Stoke will be up for it. Any, any side Lou Makari's in charge of will be, will be uh, fighting hard all the way to the end, and we expected that. But I thought in the first half we didn't, um, we didn't give them the respect in that respect. I think that's an intelligent team with a strong mentor. They never give up, and uh, when you see the players, how they react in uh, the dressing room every time before the game at half-time, they really want uh, always to win, and that's. Uh, I think they have a mentality of a big club players, and uh, so I'm very pleased with the players. Stoke Arsenal Cup ties always seem to finish down the years in a draw at first. You don't know about that, but it goes back to my days, I can assure you. Mm -hmm. uh, early Stoke possession tonight, Robbie, wasn't it? They did really well yeah, early Yeah, they on. did really well, although they didn't really trouble David Seaman too, too much. Um, but it was a tough game, and, and Stoke battled really well. A lot of skill involved with the goal. Yeah. Beautiful chip, I thought. A great technique by Keane to chip the ball um, just in the space behind Ad Adams and Mike Sharon anticipated it well and managed to just get a foot on the ball and, and steer it home. So a great start for Stoke. Mm -hmm. Maybe David Seaman should have hurled himself at it at the end. We might be having a chat about that, I think. <laughs> Second half, though, was mainly Arsenal. Um, he can't keep this guy out, the, out of the... In the papers, really, is in the papers for good or bad, day in, day out, Ian Wright. Yeah, typical Ian Wright. I mean, whatever problems seem to happen outside of the game, he can focus himself on, on what he does best, and that's finishing goals in here. Handball there or not? You reckon? Slightly, but by the defender's um, reaction, it doesn't seem so. He, it's a great skill he turns, and it's a typical Ian Wright finish. Leaves the defender um, on the seat of his pants, really, and managed to sneak it home. You, you know Ian pretty well. Give me yeah. a view of the guy. I think he's a wholehearted, 100% player who, who gives 100%. And, and sometimes people some view that wrongly, that, he, that he's um, a little bit over-enthusiastic. But I'd love an Ian Wright in my team any day of the week. Great skill he has, doesn't he's, he? He's great. a great skill. And when games are tight like that, nil-nil or you're one nil down, there's no one better than Ian Wright in your team to get you back on level terms. But Stoke are still to be beaten at Highbury, aren't they, Rob? Because right. Lou Macari, the manager there, he'll have them wound up. Lou McCoy well gets into. his teams very fit and very organised and um, I'm sure there's a lot more football to play but you'd like to feel that Arsenal are probably going to be um, hopefully get through that, that cup time. Yeah, certainly from our regional point of view as well. Well, more of tonight's game still to come including Spurs at home to Sunderland and on West Ham against Nottingham Forest. But let's catch up now on last night's ties. Gabriel Clark starts our roundup with the Premiership's form team and indeed Robbie Earle's team, Wimbledon. Luton Town achieved what no Premier League side has managed in two months. They denied Wimbledon victory. Alan Kimball's free kick was turned in by Dean Holdsworth. But Luton weren't intimidated, and they stretched their own unbeaten run to nine games, equalising before half-time and threatening to win the match in the second half. Kerry Hughes' skidding left-foot shot made it one-all. They replay at Kenilworth Road in three weeks' time. The death of Matthew Harding will overshadow all the talk of the result at Burnden Park. The commentator is John Helm. He's managed to get that ball back here. Minto's made a good run and the run is continued and the shot's a good one. And Chelsea have a goal in the first two minutes of the game from Scott Minto. Bolton's first corner. It's taken a long time in coming, it doesn't matter, it's gone straight in. And John McGinley has got that touch from almost on the line. With Blake in there, with Franson in there. And there's the flick from Franson, and Bolton Wanderers lead by two goals to one. It's Nathan Blake at the back post with the header. Ray Harford has endured some disappointing nights since taking over at Blackburn Rovers, but this defeat might now persuade Blackburn owner Jack Walker that a change has to be made. It was Rovers captain Tim Sherwood who headed into his own net for the only goal, but Stockport deserved their victory 
And but for Tim Flowers, Blackburn's embarrassment could have been even greater. More than 10,000 squeezed into Gillingham's Priestfield Stadium, too many according to the police. But everything started smoothly for Coventry City, who'd scored just six goals in 12 games, but then came two in two minutes. Paul Telfer was the source. First, he converted Dion Dublin's layoff. Then, when John Salako escaped down the Coventry left once more and curled over another cross, Telfer was left unmarked to head in. But Coventry's confidence is rather fragile, and the night became increasingly uncomfortable for Ron Atkinson. When Ifion Europe, one of the country's informed strikers, made it eight in nine games, Gillingham realised they had a chance. And 15 minutes from the end, Simon Ratcliffe, a player Atkinson once signed for Manchester United, denied his old boss victory with a real cup tie classic. Port Vale and Oxford drew nil-nil. York City managed to frustrate Leicester City for an hour before a wonderful goal from Leicester's ever-improving Neil Lennon, the Northern Ireland international. And after that, second division York City were never going to repeat their headline-making victories over Manchester United and Everton. Four minutes from the end, Lennon and Mike Whitlow created a fine goal for Simon Grayson to make sure of Leicester's place in round four. For the second year running, Crystal Palace have gone out of this competition to Ipswich Town, who'd been booed off by their fans at the weekend. And Ipswich looked in for another depressing time when Carl Vayat scored for Palace four minutes in. After a nil-nil draw at Selhurst Park earlier in the season, Dave Bassett had criticised Ipswich's ultra-defensive tactics. Last night, though, they had to attack, and they did it rather well. Paul Mason lobbed Chris Day. It was 2-1 to Ipswich before half-time. Mason crossed for Alex Mathy to head in. Bassett hopes to sign Southampton's former Chelsea striker Neil Shipperley before the weekend. He called this performance the worst since he took over. Mathy's ninth of the season was followed 13 minutes from the end by another for Mason. And having been beaten only once before the weekend, Palace have now lost two in a row. Well, what a shock for Palace, but uh, Robbie, let me talk to you about uh, Wimbledon, your mm. side. A little bit of shock for you last night, wasn't it, after the winning run? That's right, we were a little bit below uh, par um, against last Luton. night. Against the Luton side, that, uh, all due respect to them, they played very well, uh, were very competitive, kept the ball well and, and made it difficult for us. You've had an amazing run though, haven't you? What That's is right. it, seven wins now? We're Are you off this record? On. That's right, we've got uh, Middlesbrough away to, to equal the record of eight Premiership wins, so... We're looking forward to it, and we know last night we dipped below the standards that we've set, but um, Joe's making sure we'll be on song on Saturday. Third in the table, That's in the right. Premiership table. That's right, we keep turning it the other way, upside down, and thinking, well, maybe I'll be third from the <laughs> bottom, but uh, no, it's nice to be up there, and we feel on merit. You're earning good press. Yeah. I mean, what are the lads saying to that? That's not normal for, for a start. For a There's change, such good yeah. press everywhere. That's right. Um, we're not used to it, really, and we, we think we'd better get back to the good old days when people were writing us off. But, uh, no, we're pleased, and it's nice to be up there with the big boys. Joe Kinnear and Terry Burton, they deserve the credit, don't they? That's right. Tactically, um, Joe and Terry do a, a great job, and, and we're, you know, we're always well-prepared, well-organised, and we feel we're a match for most people. Is it true Sam Hammond says he's having trouble with the bonuses? He's, That's he's not... right. Uh, he doesn't like us scoring too many goals, or he... He comes out of his back pocket, so um, he's not too happy at the moment. Yeah, well, well done for that. We'll earn a one-all draw at Stoke for North London rivals Tottenham tonight. It was Sunderland at home in an all-premiership encounter. Team news, Tottenham keep the same side that won 3-0 at Middlesbrough on Saturday. And while Sunderland have Lionel Perez from Bordeaux in goal for Tony Coton, sadly injured at Southampton at the weekend and out for the rest of the season. Darius Kubitsky returns at full-back. Commentary comes from Trevor Harris. Keeper comes for it. Oh, he doesn't uh, make a very confident job of that. It was knocked back by Howells. And a gentle piece of fielding practice in the end for Lionel Perez. But he didn't look comfortable when that first cross came in. This time the outswinger from Michael Gray. Played short to ball. And it was blocked by his own man, in fact. David Kelly's shot blocked by his own man just in front of Ian Walker and I'm not sure the keeper would have got to it lucky break for Spurs
Kept in by Stewart, looking for Bridges. Oh, he's sorted out, Calderwood. Bridges, ball, and it's 1-0 Sunderland. And they've hit Spurs with a real sucker punch here. Bad defending, and the skipper gets the goal. They've soaked up a lot of pressure, and they've hit Spurs hard, and with deadly effect, with half an hour gone. Calderwood in all sorts of trouble, praised Bridges for his perseverance, kept cool there, and ball couldn't miss. Now, can Spurs come back quickly? They're trying to with Armstrong. Nielsen deflected wide. It hit Andy Merville, I think. Justin Edinburgh. Armstrong. Dangerous. Didn't really get a hold of it. It really opened up for him, Chris Armstrong. Good jump again from Sheringham, and he was being held as well, says the referee. And this is just about Tenny Sheringham's range. He scored two from two cracking free kicks already this season, including one on Saturday. Wilson there as well who can hit it, now going back towards the wall. I think he'd go uh, odds on a Sheringham curler, there it is, and a good save. He really is Mr. Free Kick here, Teddy Sheringham at White Hart Lane. In fact, in the country, very few better than him with a dead ball. That time the goalkeeper saw enough to push it wide. Corner to Spurs. Keeper comes again for it, and heavens above, catches it this time. Well, the Geordie fans behind his goal will love him for that. Terrific save from the free kick. Wilson. Edinburgh's cross again. And again, Richard Ald in the way. So Spurs have another chance to build from the halfway line. That's towards Sheringham. Won it well. Fox. Couldn't keep it down. He was leaning back, Rule Fox. And the ball ballooned way over Lionel Perez's crossbar. Super flick from Sheringham. And Fox chose to hit it on the half volley, but hit it over. Forward from Adam. That's a good ball. Howells. Got a few options here. Goes on his own, and not too far away. Well, the expression says it all. Spurs' best ever of the match. David Howells within a whisker of equalising. No challenge from the Sunderland defender. And Perez, I think, wouldn't have sniffed it. Clive Wilson. So it's better pressure from Spurs until the final ball again would have left Jerry Francis tearing his hair out. They made the space for the cross, couldn't find the pass to put the man in. Long throw, Sheringham's flick. Allen, must be for Armstrong. And the flag stays down and Chris Armstrong has put Spurs level. And the Sunderland players stand perplexed. They couldn't understand why there was no flag. And in the end, the simplest of finishes for Chris Armstrong, his fourth goal of the season, and just when it seemed when Spurs were never going to break through, Armstrong has done the trick for them. A long throw from Edinburgh, good flick, but he looked onside actually there, 
and the simplest of jobs to beat the keeper. We've got a minute plus injury time left. Can Spurs snatch a dramatic winner? Carr with the free kick. Fox got a header, great save by Perez. It was Sol Campbell who came through. He wasn't picked up. And a splendid reaction save from the Frenchman. It's it there now though. A real scramble. And Spurs are in the fourth round of the Coca-Cola Cup. Just a few seconds after being denied, Sol Campbell has made it Spurs 2, Sunderland 1. A real sickener for Sunderland. Jubilation for Tottenham. We worked, we didn't think we were at the ball game, particularly first half. And, um, you know, you find yourself 1-0 down in a cup tie. And the thing is, you've got to go and change it. And, um, you know, 45 minutes can be a long time. Um, and as it turned out, we managed to get a fairly late equaliser. 72nd or 75th minute, whatever it was, and uh, last minute, last seconds, you get the winner. And um, the only good thing about it is they can't come back at you. Quite right, quite a comeback. A good night for Tottenham. But what about West Ham United? Nottingham Forest with the opposition at Upton Park, and that's where Gabriel Clark begins his roundup of all the other matches played tonight in the Coca Cola Cup. Well, West Ham's mix of homegrown and foreign talent excel tonight. Nottingham Forest never got to grips with the Portuguese winger Hugo Porfirio. Ian Dowie was the first to benefit. Forrest were level at half-time. Dean Saunders swivelled onto David Phillips' free kick and Colin Cooper headed in. But Porfirio and West Ham were superb in the second half. Porfirio's pass was perfect for Ian Dowie. Porfirio is on loan from Sporting Lisbon but manager Harry Redknapp says he's certain to sign full-time. On this form, they'd be uproar if he didn't. From Dowie's back heel this time, Porfirio scored his first goal in English football. Forrest were well beaten. West Ham are on their way to the fourth round and their biggest win of the season so far, after Alf Inge Haaland brought down Stan Lazaridis. Julian Dix was able to round things off with a typically no-nonsense flourish. No Alan Shearer for Newcastle and no sign of the stunning form that had demolished Manchester United. Oldham had created the better chances before Scott McNiven was penalised for handball. Peter Beardsley's penalty kick should have been the trigger for more goals, but Newcastle had to settle for 1-0. Seventy places separated Southampton and Lincoln, but the third division team weren't overawed in the slightest, and Mark Hone gave them a half-time lead. Southampton had been sluggish, Matt Letissier had only been on the fringe of things, but sometimes that's when he's at his most dangerous. Barry Richardson was the latest goalkeeper, bemused by a flash of inspiration from the enigmatic Letissier. A typical volley from the Channel Islander, it was his eighth of the season. And suddenly Southampton came to life. Graham Souness has just invested in three new foreign players. One of them, Dutch defender Ulrich van Hobbel, made it 2-1 from Jason Dodd's cross. But instead of accelerating away to victory, Southampton began to coast and it cost them. Five minutes from the end, and after another long throw hadn't been dealt with, Gareth Ainsworth wasn't picked up at the far post, and his goal means a replay at Lincoln in three weeks' time. Manchester United fielded just three first-team regulars for their tie against Swindon. Gary Bloom is the commentator. Thornley links up with Scholes. Poborski now for Manchester United, and that's 1-0. Carol Poborski scores after 19 minutes. A sweeping move by Manchester United, involving Ben Thornley and Paul Scholes, and finished off with some style by the Czech Republic international, Carol Poborski. Walters to take the corner kick. Seagraves is up there. It's played to the back post. Seagraves. Swindon Town, who are level. 
Peter Thorne on target after six minutes of the second period. This is Keane. He has the beating of Leach. Skulls! United are in front! Paul Skulls on target. And on that occasion, there was little Frank Tavia could do in the Swindon Town goal. One of Middlesbrough's Brazilians, Branco, returned to South America today. The two that remain were instrumental in tonight's emphatic victory. Juninho sambered through for the first. Burroughs' other Brazilian, Emerson, had scored a second before half-time. You give him space on the edge of the area at your peril. Huddersfield did manage to contain Middlesbrough's £7 million man, Fabrizio Ravanelli, for 70 minutes, but the Italian wasn't to be frozen out. He thought about passing, but then got lucky with a deflection. Five minutes later, Ravanelli had made it 13 for his season so far. One touch from Emerson, wonderful vision from Ravanelli. And this was a night for all Brian Robson's foreign recruits to indulge themselves. Nick Barmby wasn't even on the subs bench. He'd been replaced by Denmark's Mikkel Beck, who turned to score his first goal at the Riverside Stadium. 5-0, and Huddersfield's best player had been goalkeeper Steve Francis. But the First Division side did sign off with a goal, headed in by Andy Payson. 5-1. Ellen Road staged a repeat of last season's final. This time the holders had to work a bit harder. Lee Sharp put Leeds in front with 20 minutes left. The lead lasted barely 60 seconds. Sasa Churchic crossed and Ian Taylor, a scorer at Wembley in April, scrambled the ball in. And it got better for Villa. 13 minutes from the end, Dwight York fell under Paul Beasley's challenge. And George Graham won't be going to Wembley again in this competition. York's penalty put the holders through into round four. And George Graham will not be a happy man, I know that, will he, Robbie Earl? No, not at no all. No chance. Let's just talk about two more of our local sides, Spurs and the West Ham. Harry Redknapp, yeah. he's a happy man tonight. He's talking about this new guy from Portugal, little guy, Hugo yeah. Porfirio. That's right. Um, yeah, Harry's brought a few of the um, foreign players over and it seems when they do click that they, they, they make them a good side. He's particularly talking tonight, I noticed on the wires about uh, Porfirio mm -hmm. and when Paolo Futre of course who's there, I mean that's, that's, right. that's quite a combination. That's an exciting side and like I say once it, it, if it all clicks I think um, you know they're going to be a good test for anybody. Good win for them wasn't it's it? It's a great win tonight. Very yeah. good. Now then Tottenham Great credit on the way they came back in that game because they looked to be really up against it. That's right, against a tough uh, Sunderland team. And um, I think Jerry will be pleased that they've showed good character to come back from the one goal down and get themselves in front and um, keep going to the end. And Sol Campbell's happily nicked the goal for them. Three straight wins. I mean, he's not uh, that money's not coming forth for buying players, or maybe it is there, but he's not buying players. But it's three straight wins. For... That's right. And you tend to feel with the Tottenham side, you know, they're always good in cups, and it could be their uh, one of the big chances of winning silverware this season. Yeah. We like to pick out on this programme late in the evening a little bit of the spectacular. Mm -hmm. And this man, Letizia, keeps pop popping up. Talk us through this one. That's Robbie. right. Um, you can't keep him out of the news in these situations. It gets laid back in what's really a nothing area. He flicks it up and it's a magnificent strike. 30 yards and you know, leaves the keeper flailing. Really. What are your views on him? And there are so many opinions on Matthew Letizia. Yeah, I'm a Letizia lover. At times I think there's a little bit too much pressure on him to perform and they often say if Letizia doesn't play, Southampton doesn't play. And I think that's a little bit unfair on Matt to heap that much pressure onto him, really. You do, do you? Yeah, I, I feel that there's ten other players out there at Southampton and it's probably unfair to, to say that it's just a one-man team and they should be pulling along as well to make it more of a team effort. Absolutely, yeah. OK, well now let me reveal for all of you the draw for the fourth round which was made a little earlier this evening. Here we go with that draw. Charlton or Liverpool versus Stoke or Arsenal. If it's the big ones, that's a repeat of uh, a couple of years back when Liverpool won. West Ham United against Stockport County. Ipswich versus Gillingham or Coventry. Bolton versus Spurs. What a tough one that is for Tottenham. Remembering Bolton knocked out Arsenal a couple of seasons ago as well as they went all the way to Wembley in this competition. Middlesbrough versus Newcastle. What a game in store. 
at the Riverside. That will re really be a terrific game. Wimbledon or Luton, Robbie Earls looking with great interest at this moment against Aston Villa, the holders. Port Vale or Oxford against Southampton or Lincoln City. Leicester City against Manchester United. That's another premiership game and they're to be played the week beginning November the 25th. Let's start, uh, Robbie, with uh, Wimbledon. Yeah, we're assuming, or well, maybe we shouldn't assume That's here, right. that you're going to get through against mm -hmm. Luton, but the cup holders, Villa. That's right, a tough tie at Luton first, but then if we can get through, we've got the cup holders who, who seem to be going quite well again, picked up some good form, and that'll be another tough tie, so um, one we'd look forward to there. What about Charlton against Stoke? Yeah, I think that's optimistic <laughs> for the first division, Charlton v Stoke. I'm sure Liverpool and Arsenal will have something to say about that, and we'd expect that Liverpool-Arsenal to be the tie, really. I think looking at through the ties, you know, tonight, I, I think Middlesbrough against Newcastle. Yeah, that's it. Uh, up, up there in the northeast, which has become so exciting. That's right, a fantastic tie for the northeast, and two great sides, two attacking sides, and that makes for, for a great contest. The players up there on the northeast are incredible, aren't they? That's right, very much attacking-based players. Both Brian Robson and Kevin Keegan have assembled. Um, both offensive teams and basically it could be sort of a six each six all game there as a professional in in the game mm -hmm. are you for all these players coming from the likes of Portugal and Brazil and and all over the world really to this country yeah I think as long as we're getting the quality end of the market then it's improving our game we're seeing gates going up more people are coming and, and enjoying the football and I think it's great for the young young kids to see top-class internationals over here in England Improving our game, or do you mean improving you as a professional? I, I think mean, you... both, really, improving our game and I improving the standards of professional players in the country at the moment. Yeah. And Bolton against Spurs. I mentioned that one. I said that mm. it's a potentially it's a difficult tie, That's isn't it? It's a very it? tricky one. Bolton are a great cup side, got good cup tradition in over the few years, and, and like we saw last night, you know, bundled Chelsea out of the competition, and I'm sure they'll be looking to do the same to Tottenham. Mm. Yeah, well, it's a really smashing draw tonight, Robbie. Now, just a final word about Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. Are you going to get that uh, eighth straight win? Yeah, I think we'll have the ghetto blaster turned up extra loud on Saturday and we'll be looking to uh, match the record of Manchester United. Do you really, really believe you could finish top of the Premiership? We always believe that and Sam and Man believes it and we want to earn a few quid out of him. It's great to have you with us. Thanks very much, Robbie. Thanks, Bob. Well, next week sees another busy week of football on ITV. On Monday night, Gabriel Clark introduces his weekly roundup of nationwide league football at 12.40. On Wednesday evening, then, at live 7.20, Manchester United could secure qualification to the Champions League quarterfinals by beating Fenerbahce. And on Thursday night at 11.45, join me for highlights of Liverpool's Cup Winners' Cup tie against FC Sion of Switzerland. Liverpool, remember, a two-on up from the first leg. Well, that's for tonight. It's well done to West Ham United and to Tottenham Hotspur. Arsenal get a second chance, and it was so, so close to Charlton causing an upset against mighty Liverpool. From all of us for now, bye-bye.